What do you see as like the big unanswered questions in climate science? There are some really clear, outstanding questions um, that we're struggling to answer. Uh, one of them is how things play out at a local level. We're in Miami, we have some very clear local uh, issues that are associated with large-scale climate change. How does that work out? What are people to do? Are we really applying our science to really answering the questions that we have on the ground. A lot of the, the stuff that's being done um, at the national labs or at NASA or, or you know, with, with climate models is the global picture. It's the big things that are changing. But, but when it comes down to the, the, the small local stuff, it's much harder. But those are the questions that people are asking us. And people always come back to, given the choices of things that we could do, what should we do, right? Which are the best things to do? And we have not designed our science to be able to answer those questions very effectively. You know, somebody says, well, should we do a cap and trade system or a carbon tax or, a, or, or mandated um, restrictions? Which one of those is going to be the best? But even if you work all that out, we're not doing the science that says what that choice is. You know, if you look at the different uh, scenarios that we put together, the, the basis of the IPCC or, or something. We've got a, basically, we've got a high scenario, a middle scenario, and a low optimistic uh, scenario. And we say, well, you know, the real world's going to be somewhere in the middle. But that doesn't tell us what any body group should do to make any of those choices. Each of those storylines is like totally different, right? They're not comparable one to the other. They don't, they don't tell you, uh, you know, what the consequences are for, you know, electrifying the car network. You know, what are the benefits going to be in terms of air pollution or in terms of congestion or in terms of um, energy use of just that change? Oh, well, IPCC is totally silent. No, we, nobody did those experiments, right? So why did we not do those experiments? Because they're too policy specific and we don't do enough policy specific stuff. So can we do more? Absolutely. Right? Is there real science that isn't just opinion that, that we could be doing to inform decisions better? And the, and the answer is yes. What about this uh, issue of communicating uncertainty? I feel like that's something we struggle with, especially when you hear climate talks. It's all, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. But you know, when I hear that stuff, it's, well, the models tell you a range of options. So do we need to do a better job of communicating uncertainty? Or? Well, actually, I think we do, we, we, we do too good a job at communicating uncertainty because we generally start off with, like, here are all the problems. But, like, you know, here, I've, like, I kind of made some like, tiny little conclusion here, which might have some implication for... We're actually far too timid. Uh, and we generally, you know, start off with all of the, the problems and then we kind of conclude something vague. If you study communication and you say, well, okay, how, what, what's a way to get people to come away with the same level of, of confidence that you have? That's not how you start. If you start off by just talking about all the problems, uh, then people only remember the problems because basically they remember like the first five minutes of anything you say. Right, you've already forgotten why. But anyway, <laughs> Wait, what? What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So you know what's what is it you want people to go away with? Start with that, and then fill in the details. And in fact, I think we do a fine job uh, at, at talking about the caveats and talking about the problems. But but it becomes a talking point when people don't want to pay attention to what you're saying. Is oh, we haven't discussed enough of the uncertainties because they're not interested in the uncertainties. They just want the whole thing to go away, right? And so when we pander to people who are not giving us advice in good faith, we're just wasting our time in theirs, right? So, you know, we have been able to conclude many, many things that are relevant for the discussion. You know, it isn't, um, uh, it isn't impossible to give a precise accounting of, of what the, uh, the attribution of current changes are to, to greenhouse gases. We know that almost everything that we're seeing in the last century is due to greenhouse gases, right? Everything else basically cancels out. You know, the issue when you're communicating is not to communicate that we've looked at a thousand different things. The issue is to communicate what we've concluded, right? What the balance of the evidence tells us is going on. Because that's what people don't understand. People understand there's a thousand different things. People understand that things are complicated. You don't need to, you don't need to, uh, it's not a hard communication task to tell people that the weather is complicated, right? People already know these things. How did you get started with um, being a climate communicator? I was always somebody who liked to bring things together and kind of see what the, the big picture was. So, you know, 
there's two kinds of scientists, really. You know, there's the people who go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into their one particular thing, and that, and you know, and that's been very powerful. You know, this kind of re reductionism um, in science has been very powerful. Right? You know, that's that's uh, you know that's been the basis of a lot of things. But but there's a lot of other people who spend their time trying to bring all those insights together. Right. So people people have described it as the the, the, the lumpers or the splitters. Right, so the lumpers are the people who are doing the synthesis, and then the splitters are the people who say, "No, no, no, let, let me just like kind of clear through the hit and just focus on this one tiny little thing." And science is actually a, a very dynamic balance between these two groups of people. I mean, if being very general, right? Um, and so I, I'm I'm much more of the the lumper. You know, I want to pull things together so that I can see the big picture and the emergent properties. And and other people I know are very much you know, the details. And so when I started doing, uh, you know, the climate modeling, where you have to be a lumper because you're bringing in together, you know, the details of cloud microphysics and ocean circulation and land surface properties and evapotranspiration in plants and, you know, uh, polar stratospheric clouds, you can't be an expert on everything of those things. You have to, you know, you just have to wrangle the people who do know about these things to give you the information that you need to put these things together. That was a very natural basis for me to talk about the large scale, the big picture, the emergent properties, without getting too caught up in, you know, the details of radiative transfer or the details of aerosol microphysics. When I kind of I guess in the early 2000s, um, you know, I started to kind of be more aware of the public discussion. Uh, I remember there was there was one article in one of the free kind of alter out weeklies in New York, and the, the guy that wrote it just kind of went off in some totally opposite direction, quoting a paper that we'd been talking about, and, and he got it completely 180 degrees wrong, right? He said, oh, this, this wiggle here shows what a terrible job the models do, but he couldn't see the two lines because the model line was right on top of the observational line. <laughs> there was actually indistinguishable. To everything he said in that was wrong. So I thought, you know what, let me help him out. I wrote a little letter uh, pointing out that he got it totally wrong. But, but being nice, I was, I was being nice, right? I was like, oh, you know, letting you know that, you know, you've actually misinterpreted this. That's actually, you know, and you said, no, that's not right. And, blah, blah, blah. and I, I don't know what it was. I, thought, I think maybe I thought that I would be, um, that he would thank me or just let it go <laughs> or something. But no, like, so they published my letter, and then there was like a whole page rant about how my agenda was showing, and uh, you know, and how uh, I'm totally wrong, and uh, blah, 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 without really, I mean, and I conceded like some tiny little point that, that I had made. But and it was, and I was going, oh, well, that seems a little harsh, <laughs> and uh, and and it was. <laughs> I was going, okay, so maybe this communication thing is a little bit more difficult than I thought. <laughs> And, and so, you know, so it was right from the very beginning, you realize that this was not a, a straight conversation where somebody was asking you a question, you tell them what the answer is, or you, or you help them understand where, where the answers might be. And so, you know, I did a little bit more of that, and I did a little, you know, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, but this isn't very effective, right? You know, because it was like one-to-one, -one, people were like, nobody was paying it. They're like, so how can you be more effective? And so, I don't know, like 2004, you know, blogs were the thing, and so we said, oh, we should have a blog, and then we'd be able to answer people in real time and provide the context that's otherwise missing in mainstream media communications. And uh, lots of people said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Somebody should do that. Um, and this, and this conversation went on for about a year. And, uh, and at some point, I'm going, no, I, like, enough with the whole waiting for somebody else to do what it is that you think is worth doing. You, we should just do this. And so I said, OK, so and I, I, I called a few people, and I tried to put a group together and it turns oh yeah we thought about doing the same thing but we were hoping somebody else would do it no okay well we're gonna do it we're gonna do it um and so we got a little bit of uh we got a little bit of like backing to kind of push us to do it and uh, and so we did and you know and it wasn't uh, there wasn't a total unalloyed success but it's been a very interesting uh process and, and the best of it is really very good um and the worst of it we don't need to discuss <laughs> <laughs> is there do you have any like general recommendations for what grad students can do to succeed in the field from a job perspective or to improve as scientists? Climate is a, a growth industry, unfortunately. Um, that's good for you, bad for the planet. There are a, a tremendous amount of real questions that, that people have. We haven't totally designed the scientific field to, to focus on, but where you can, you should, uh, because that's where 
you know, people are going to care about your research. And there's nothing better than having people care about what you do. Right? It gets what gets you up in the morning. It's what gets you past all of the, the BS that comes with being an academic in, in, in some senses. You, you can do it because you know that what you're doing matters to more than just reviewer one, two, and three, and more than just your supervisor, and more than just your program manager. It matters outside of that. And if you can be working on stuff that matters to more and more people, then you're not going to have a problem getting a job. You're not going to have a problem uh, finding ways to do what it is that you want to do. There's a thousand different things you can do. Go for the things that matter. So you're giving a big Sea Secrets talk this evening. Can you give us a, a preview? <laughs> Can you give us a preview of what you're going to talk about? You know, my science is, uh, is all about climate modeling. And yet that's something that people really don't understand. Right? You know, you talk about models, people think you're talking about L. McPherson. Oh, I don't know, that's old. Uh, <laughs> who's a current model? I don't know. I don't even know who a current model is. Uh, people don't understand what you're talking about. Right? They don't understand what, what, what simulation really is. They don't understand how good it is. Um, they don't understand what, what it tells us, what we can conclude. So what I like to do is kind of like draw people into my world a little bit uh, and then expel them from that world and then tell them <laughs> what it is that, uh, that you can conclude from these things and, and, and make it clear that you know we're not, we're not just at, at, at the whim of extraterrestrial forces here. You know, we have choices individually as, a, as, a, as members of a group, as members of society uh, that are making a difference and helping people understand that what they decide to do and how they decide to engage in this will make a difference. And, and, uh, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a good and relatively hopeful message uh, despite, the, uh, despite the somewhat dramatic graphics. <laughs> So people deal with uncertainty on a daily basis. I mean, every, every decision we make is based on probabilities and uncertainties. But somehow this climate change issue mm -hmm. has been shrouded with the fact that we're really not entirely 100% sure. And so people, why do you think people are so fo focused on the fact that we're not absolutely sure, that we're only maybe 95% sure, and that this is a massive problem, that we can't prove it absolutely, that we we can't say that for sure anthropogenic produced CO2 is resulting in climate change. Why do populations not just say, well, based on levels of uncertainty that we accept for everything else in our lives, every medication we take and every time we get into a car, mm -hmm. we're willing to take this risk, but we're not willing to take this risk on climate change. Right. So, you, I mean, you put your finger on it. It's not a rational statement. <laughs> yeah. right? So where is that coming from? Where is that you know, is that really coming from people, or is it coming from people who just want to mess up the, the conversation to avoid people getting to the conclusion? And for a large part of it, it's the latter, right? You know, people, um, people do, you know, you talk to people about uncertainty and whether it's going to rain or not. Uh, I, I, you know, here, I guess it's a little bit more predictable. But in, uh, but in, uh, in New York, yeah, you know, 30% like chance of rain. Do I take an umbrella? Do I not take an umbrella? People think about these things all the time. And they don't have huge existential crises about weather forecasts. When it comes to this, you know, when people talk about the risks, you know, people, people get it. You know, there's no, uh, I, I think it's a little bit of a red herring uh, and a deliberate red herring that's been kind of thrown up. Oh, you don't talk about it. And so, oh, you're not 100% sure. But that's really somebody saying, I don't want to hear what you're concluding. I don't want to think that I have to change anything. I don't want this to impact on where I live, how I, uh, you know, how I travel, um, uh, you know, what kind of appliances I buy. Uh, it, 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 it's that kind of level. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a conversation at the scientific level that, you, that, that it sounds like it should be. It's not that conversation. Can you talk about um, the climate science work that's just kind of overall going on at where you work? At yeah, um, so, so this is not a very big lab, right? We're a very small part of NASA. Um, but we work uh, on kind of uh, four main areas. Uh, the biggest area is in climate simulations. So we're trying to make uh, the best and most complete models of what's actually going on in the climate system, all the way down from you know, c cloud microphysics and, and that, their interaction with aerosols uh, to you know, what's happening to ocean circulation over the scale of thousands of years. Uh, we work a lot on uh, impacts. So 
uh, you know, trying to work out you know, what's going to happen and how people are going to adapt to uh, changes that, that are going to impact agriculture. You know, what crops are going to be grown, when, how you're going to change, uh, the, the, where you grow them, how you grow them, um, what are pests going to do. And that's, so, so we work a lot on that. Uh, we work a lot on uh, observations. So uh, we have uh, a couple of instruments. Uh, that the main one is a polarimeter for measuring uh, aerosols in the atmosphere that we fly around on uh, and NASA campaigns. And that we have that was on the Glory mission, but unfortunately that, that did not achieve orbit. So, so we're still trying to get it back on a satellite. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the Institute for Space Studies and, and that kind of like the space part of it kind of went down for a little bit. Uh, but it's coming back up because of uh, the, uh, the huge number of discoveries that we're making about exoplanets. Um, and the upcoming uh, test mission, the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which are going to give us more information about uh, exoplanets than we've, than we've ever seen. Um, uh, even to the point where we'll be able to get um, spectra through atmospheres of nearby planets. And the questions that arise then, well, are these planets habitable? What kind of climates do they have? It turns out that the models that we've built for the Earth now contain enough of the physics that are relevant to all these different exoplanets that we can now take our Earth models and apply them to exoplanets. Uh, and then like, and this, that's a real out-of-sample test, right? You know, we know nothing about them right now, and we're making predictions about what kind of climate they're going to have. That's kind of interesting because what we, when we started models, we started off with radiator transfer, and that radiator transfer was, was initially designed to try and work out why the climate of Venus was as hot as it was. All right, so Carl Sagan, Jim Hansen, that's, that's where they all did their, their initial work. Um, and then that code has ended up in our Earth GCMs, and which is now being applied to exoplanets and the climate of Titan and the climate of Venus three billion years ago. All right, so Th that, that kind of unity of physics and of application, and it's kind of the fact that it's kind of gone full circle over a 50-year period, uh, is extremely exciting. And so, uh, so that's now become like a, a kind of fourth pillar of the stuff that we do.